Well, we're tackling a tough subject, that's death. Yet with all the hype about the coronavirus, as if we think we're all going to be passing away here in the next couple of months, maybe it's good we're thinking about it. One way or another, all of us have to prepare for death. I hope that's not news to you. Not just financially, not just legally, but with far greater consequences, preparing for death spiritually. And I'm not just talking to the old people, all of us, because nobody knows how long their life will be. In fact, all of living really should be a preparation for death in one sense, for we spend much greater time on the other side than we will on this side. So if you ignore it and ignore it and ignore it, you are the greatest fool. If we prepare rightly for death, then death for the believer, and I'm talking about the true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, The death for the believer is nothing to fear, nothing to fear. It's nothing to resist thinking about. Why? Because we have a champion, Jesus Christ, and he has worked so thoroughly and so victoriously. Everything is set up for us. Everything is prepared. It's all going to be glorious. He defeated death. He turned sorrow into joy. He's turned misery into delight. This is the work of our Savior. That's why we're here and singing his name. He deserves it. He's the champion. Unbelievers, of course, are going to face a God who's angry with them. They're going to find out that even though God loves them, that God is not pleased with the way they lived, that their sin has to be punished. They'll have no Savior, and they'll stand before the judgment of God naked, and they will have their sins recounted, and they will pay with pain and shame for all of eternity for their own sin and their own life. But believers in Jesus as the Son of God for us, As Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 1, death is gain. To die is gain. For me, if you were to summarize my life, Paul said, it's Christ. And then after the life, if you were to summarize how I think about it, I would say it's this, gain, G-A-I-N, I I gain. I don't lose. Uh, Believers in Jesus Christ are not losers. We're winners, and that's why we gain. And that's really the main thought of this mini-series. To die for the Christian is gain. No wonder Jesus told his disciples On the night he was betrayed when they were not going to see him for a while. In John chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Jesus said, believe also in me, right? And then he said, in my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I am going there to prepare a place for you. That's wonderful. Jesus went there to prepare a home and a place for us, the disciples. That's fabulous. It's great news. Now, what are we doing in this series? We're asking some questions about death, and we're getting some answers from the Scriptures. In part one, if you missed it, we started really just putting our toe in and wading into the subject, not really diving into it. Um, We asked as our first question, why do we even want to know what happens after death? And we talked about everything from the fear of death to curiosity. Well, the second question we talked about last time was, How is it that we can know what happens after death? And we gave a caution about all the experiential ways that people want to try to figure out by deducing from someone that died and their heart was restored. And then we put together books and we say, this is what happens after death. That can be so. be like he gave sense human knowledge it's a revealing of things that cannot be known through human education and research and we ought to put our highest trust and confidence in holy scripture amen Amen. right it's a treasure of divine knowledge we should have our we should rest our eternity on the truth of this book and the third question that we really just began last time is what is death what even is it? So we know what it is. It's when you die, it's when you're not living. But we were looking at it a little more closely there. We saw that death is not a mere passing out of existence, as some think. It's not, as the Greeks thought, being released from the prison house of your own body. Um, death is not even soul sleep, which is taught in some of the more aberrant forms of Christianity. It's not soul sleep where you remain unconscious for centuries waiting for the day of resurrection. After death, you as a believer are going to be quite alert. You're going to be awake um, to many wondrous things that are going to be happening to you. I hope we get to some of those things today. 
Um, and this is kind of where we left off last time, the weakness of the doctrine of soul sleep. And why is it weak? Because it focuses only on one set of verses that said so-and-so slept with his fathers and doesn't look at the totality of what Scripture says, bringing them together, piecing them together so we can see the full picture of theology that the Scriptures give us. Sort of brushes aside verses that don't say we sleep and doesn't know how to harmonize those verses with the other. Well, there are many Bible passages that reveal more about the afterlife, and we want to look at them. For example, Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you will fall asleep with me for a thousand years, right? No, he didn't say that. What did he say on the cross? Today you will what? Be with me in paradise. That's Luke chapter 23 and verse 43. Not asleep in the ground. That term today is in the emphatic position in the Greek sentence there. Jesus was not saying, I'm telling you today. It was obvious that he was speaking on that day. So the point of using the word today was that's where you'll be with me on this day. And that was really obvious from the context. He wanted that thief to be reassured. Remember, he's suffering and he's dying. He's saying, let me tell you what's about to happen. When your head drops in crucifixion, you're going to enter into paradise and I will be there with you. And that's happening today. It's amazing. I don't think experiencing paradise sounds like soul sleep. Sounds much better to me. And then let's go ahead and turn in the book of Philippians to our theme verse for this. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Here as Paul contemplates the decision that he thinks is partially his, depending on how the prayers go, Either I'm going to stay in this world. Remember, he was in prison when he wrote Philippians. Either I'm going to stay in this world and I'm going to continue to minister as an apostle or I'm going to die. They're going to decide, Paul, we're going to take your life and you're going to die. And he said, as I'm thinking about which one I would rather have, I'm kind of hard pressed about this whole thing. If I stay, there's going to be a tremendous amount of fruitful labor for me in the world. Paul didn't waste his life. He was busy serving Christ, you see. But if I die, oh, it's going to be gain. And that's what he's saying. I'm in a win-win situation. That's what he's really writing. But, but look how he describes it. What is death? It's not falling asleep, verse 21. It's gain. He would never say, I'm going to be asleep for about a thousand years, and I'm going to be cold, and I'm going to be six feet under, and that is described as gain. Boy, are you really stretching interpretation when you do that. But it gets better. Go, to, go down. Let your eyes glance down to verse 23. He says, I'm hard-pressed from both directions. Can't figure out what it is I really want to do having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Notice three more descriptions that go into life after life or life after death. This should get us excited. Number one, Paul uses the term depart. I'm going to depart to be with Christ. I'm going to leave. I'm going on a journey. I'm getting out of here. And I'm going to be with Christ. I'm going somewhere else. Where is Christ? Well, Christ had already ascended into heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. So to depart means to leave the planet, and to go be with Christ means to go be where he is. This isn't rocket science. We can figure this out. Number two, he says, we are going to be with Christ. In other words, it's departing and being with Christ are two sides of the same coin, and, and, and really that has the idea of fellowship. I'm going to be with Christ. There's Christ where he is, and I am going to be with him, and, and, and I'm going to have fellowship with him. I'm going to have a relationship with him. I'm instantly going to be there. It's just beautiful. And then number three, he describes the whole experience as very much better if you have the NASB. Very much better. <laughs> well, Paul did not long for death so he could sleep for hundreds of years, right? I know some people love their sleep, but I wouldn't prescribe that, you know, hundreds of years of sleep as very much better. You know, if you have uh, the Net Bible, it says better by far. If you have the King James, it's far better. Polis Crazone. Very much better. It's a, it's a comparison, a heightened comparison, much greater. And so you see, wow, this is something for the believer that's going to be fantastic. All right, that's a quick look at Philippians 1. I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4 now. 2 Timothy chapter 4. These are the pastoral epistles. This anticipation of what happens after death continued in Paul's life. 2 Timothy, I don't know if you realize this or not, but this is the last book that Paul wrote before he died. In fact, he knows he's about to die. And this is the last chapter that he writes. And so this thought of what's going to happen to him after dying was with him all the way to the end. And in this, this very last chapter where he's about to have his head chopped off because he was a Roman citizen, he's, he's in Rome and he's about to be executed for his, 
his Christian witness, and he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. In other words, it's so close to the time where they're about to execute me, you can say that they're already starting to pour my life out. Sort of the picture of him losing his blood and his life is being poured out as a a sacrifice to God. That's how he viewed it. And then he writes, look at the last part of verse 6. He says, and the time of my departure has come. Do you see that? Departure. Again, Paul was not looking forward to sleeping in the ground, but to departing. Analusis is the uh, noun. It's related to the verb back in Philippians chapter 1. Actually, it's a, it's a noun that was used of ships when they were tied in their moorings. They were tied up in their harbors, and then you would loose them, and then they would set sail. They would, they would get going on their journey. They would depart from the land, and they would head out in the sea. That's kind of the idea. I'm going to, at the time of my, my vacation, the time of my departing, the time of my journey has come. It's amazing how he thought about this. Let the journey begin is sort of how he was thinking. Physical death is not final. It's a journey. We're loosed from life and experience in this world and from this body, and we go on a trip. Paul says, a really fantastic trip. Destination, paradise. Destination, the third heaven. Destination, where Jesus Christ in his glory is that he described as the Father's house. Far better than Viking cruises, I would say. Far better. There's really so much more evidence against soul sleep if we were to take time to do this. Stephen, when he was being martyred in Acts chapter 7, stones are pounding him to death. He's about to die. He got a vision of Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And what did he say to Jesus? He said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. You see, see the motion, right? Something's going to be coming out of me and I'm going to be flying up there. They can't even see the vision of what I'm seeing right now. I'm looking into some other dimension, but it's real. Would you take my spirit now? By the way, if you're getting close to death and you don't know what to say, I said, those are pretty good words. Say it. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. You're the one I trust. Remember what Jesus said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Remember? Moses certainly was not in soul sleep. When Peter, James, and John saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, they're up there and there was, there was Moses and Elijah. You might argue that Elijah's body was somehow snatched up because he went up in the whirlwind, but not Moses. His body was still on the ground, but there was Peter, James, and John saying, hey, that's Moses. And Moses was bounding around and doing things. He was not asleep. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Just jot that reference down. It's so important. 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 8, makes everything explicit. It says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's no delay. There's no thousand years in between that. If I'm going to leave my body, what's next? Answer, present with the Lord. Okay, that's it. You you really don't need anything else, honestly. I'm just up here filling in a little more. But if you want to know, that's kind of it. When I die, I'm going to be out of my body, and I'm going to be with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. There's just no doubt about it. We will not sleep. We will exit planet earth and be with Christ. Now, we're getting to kind of the core of what death is. Death, death is, if we were to define it, death is a separation. Death is a separation. What is it that's absent from the body and present with the Lord? And the answer is our soul, our spirit. Turn to the book of James now, James chapter 2, right after Hebrews. Just keep turning to the right there. You get Hebrews and James chapter 2, and go to the end of that chapter, verse 26. James 2, 26. And really, James 2 confirms this. Now, keep in mind, James is not really talking about death here. He's, he's using death as an illustration for a kind of faith that people say they have, but it doesn't do any works. And he's trying to say those people that say that they believe in God and believe in Jesus, but you never see them do anything about it. They never never love. You don't see any activity from their faith. That's not really a faith that can save you. That's not a faith that can justify you. So he's kind of arguing about this lame, inactive faith. But in the midst of it, he tells us really a definition, a definitional statement about death. Look at verse 26. He says, For as the body without the spirit is dead so also faith without works is dead. 
Death happens when the spirit or the soul leaves the body. The preposition without is the Greek word chorus. It means apart from. It indicates a spatial separation. The soul leaves the body. It comes out of the physical body. The the body then no longer has the spirit inside of it at death. There's separation. That's why when you look at a body that's been prepared, you know, by the, the undertaker and they've been all dressed up and the skin has been whatever they do with it. I don't really know what they do with it, you know, and it's all prepped up and you're looking at it and you're thinking, that's not, that doesn't really look like, you know, my mom or my brother or whoever it is you're mourning that's left, you know, because the person's not inside there anymore. The person's gone. It looks more like a wax figure than the loved one you remember. The body's not animated. The body's not filled with the spirit. That is the human spirit. It's not spirited. It's just a leftover shell. It's, you don't have the sense that the person's even there anymore. You're like, ah, whatever, you know, just bury, bury the body. Now, let me back up a little bit here. Verses like James chapter 2 and verse 26 teach that we human beings are two-part beings. We have two pieces to us, two parts to us. We make up two portions. We have a body, that, that part, unless folks are crazy, everyone agrees we have a body, but we also have a soul. We're two-part being, body and soul. We're not a three-part being. We're not a four-part being, five, 12, or whatever other number someone might have said to you. The proof of this is really quite abundant in scripture. For example, even in the way God made us, he made us in two steps. He made humanity in two parts. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, it says that God formed Adam's body from the dust of the ground. Step number one, part number one. And then it says, God breathed into Adam the breath of life. Step number two, part number two. So in other words, our soul that's inside of our body did not come from the wind, did not come from the body itself, did not come from nature. It came directly out of our God, our creator God. God filled our bodies with a soul slash spirit. We are thus a dichotomous being. There are also many verses where you you do a word study in Greek or a word study in Hebrew of the use of soul and spirit, and you see that they're used interchangeably. They're used as synonyms. You do the same thing with uh, the Hebrew terms, and you see they're used. Everything the soul can do, the spirit does. The things that the spirit does, the soul does. And you see they're just two ways of talking about the same immaterial part that is on the inside. Scripture never says that both a soul and a spirit came out of the body and went to heaven, as if there's two pieces that go up to heaven. The truth of dichotomy is also seen that when you describe the entire human being, the entire human being is described as two parts, not three, not four. I'll give you examples, but there are many examples of this in Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16 says, We do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. So there's two parts to us. There's an outer man, that's our body, and we're getting older and we're decaying. But our inner person, our inner man is being renewed. Two parts to it. Or Jesus' warning in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. He says, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him, he's talking about God, who is able to destroy both soul and and body in hell. In other words, fear the one who can destroy all of you. What is all of you? Soul and body. You say, well, what happened to the spirit? What happened to the mind? Those are just different ways of speaking of the soul. Your entire person can be destroyed by God and you should fear him. He can throw the whole body and the whole soul for eternity in hell. And so we are two-part beings. Well, the same is true in verses like 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5, where body and spirit are used to refer to the entire person. There you have body and spirit rather than body and soul. Or as we saw in James chapter 2 and verse 26, if the body and the soul make up the entire human being, then there is no other part to your humanity. <laughs> Now, you say, what about the verses that say that use spirit and soul and body and sometimes mind or 
or energy or different words like that. Those are just sort of heaped up ways of describing the immaterial part that is on the inside of us, just a fuller way of describing that. They're not saying, here are all these little components inside of you. They're just saying, as far as that non-physical part of you, whether you call it soul, spirit, mind, will, conscience, those are not pieces of you. It's just referring to your inner spirit person. So physical death, then, is the separation of these two parts, the material from the immaterial the soul from the body. The two come apart. The spirit does not hang out with the body, hovering around the body. By the way, that's why you don't have to be afraid of graveyards. You know, you're worried, oh, there's the graveyards and that soul or that spirit's going to be haunting that area. No, no. They're gone. They left the body. They're not going to hang around the body anymore. You know, know, maybe there's a demon down there. I guess that doesn't really reassure you. (laughs) But it's not going to be a human ghost. Most people, even unbelievers, are aware that there is a spiritual component to the human self. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7, it speaks of death this way. It says, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. See, what happens at death, the separation is, everything goes back to where it came from. The body goes back to the dust. Why? Because that's where God got it from, right? And then the spirit or soul of the human being goes back to God, either for judgment or blessing. Why? Because that's where it originated. Body to the ground, down. Soul goes back to God, up. So yes, you could say, in one sense, if you were only talking about the body, that the body sleeps. The body does sleep, figuratively speaking, right? The body lies in the ground. The eyes close. It's not moving, so you can say... Well, since Jesus is going to raise that body again, then it's okay to talk about it figuratively as sleeping because that's not going to be permanent even for the body. But the body's not literally sleeping. But what is it that happens to the soul or the spirit or the mind or the conscious portion of us? We are told that it continues. It continues its existence with the Lord Jesus Christ. On the day of the resurrection coming up in the end times, Jesus is going to take care of our bodies. You say, well, what happened if you fell in the sea and a shark ate you? And then someone else ate that shark and someone else ate that shark. Those are the kinds of problems we just leave in in the mind of God. He'll figure out how to put all the molecules back together again. What about the soldier that was blown and incinerated? What about the guy in the nuclear? You hear all these people like, there can't be a resurrection. I think that if God merely talked and all of this stuff came into existence, I figure he can do the reverse thing. You know, when we're talking about almighty God, I don't know why people come up with these little conundrums. They can't be conundrums for God. He's almighty, right? Ron Rhodes says this about death in his book. He writes, death is not the end. It is a mere transition into the afterlife, into the very presence of Jesus. Of course, he's talking about believers. Referring to his own departure, if we were to look further in 2 Timothy chapter 4, look all the way down at verse 18, Look what else he writes down at verse 18 in the same chapter. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Wow. I'm about to die. It doesn't matter. I know that the Lord has it all worked out. I, I don't know how to get from here in the prison to the throne room of Christ, Paul's writing, but I know this. He's going to bring me safely there. He had no doubts. Paul had no doubt where he was going. Paul had no doubt that God was going to be able to get his soul up where it needed to go. And I figure we should have no doubts about it either, right? All right. That's death. What is death? Now, question number four. What is it that believers will experience right after they die? The moments after we die. And this is really the heart of this mini-series. This is where my curiosity went. And of course, the scriptures don't give as many details as I wanted them to give. So I squeezed them as much as I could to see what was in there, to try to bring it out. Some of this may be a little bit of Tom's imagination, but I tried to base it on some statement of scripture so we could think this through. 
And the more I think about it, the more exciting it is. It's, it's absolutely incredible. If I, if I start weeping in the midst of this, it's just because, well, eye has not seen and ear has not heard all that God has prepared for those who love him. One of Satan's biggest lies is serving Jesus is boring and all we're going to do is play harps on a cloud and be bored to death, that, that the sinners are going to have all of the fun in the afterlife. That's one of the biggest lies. It's exactly the opposite. We're going to have all the fun and the joy. Well, we already know that at death, our bodies go in one direction, down. Our soul or spirit goes in the opposite direction, back to God. We enter into what theologians have called the intermediate state. The intermediate state. You say, what's that? It's life that we live in between life in this frail, temporary body, and then life that we will live in our future, powerful resurrection body. There's life, consciousness, and existence in between this body and the future permanent, and that is the intermediate state. And this is very important. I think most people don't realize or don't seem to understand that you don't get your resurrection body when you die. A lot of people think, you know, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven and that's it. And they forget that there's going to be a resurrection from the dead and that's going to be beyond that time. And you do not get your resurrection body the moment you die. That's just not the way the Lord has designed it. We still are going to be alive. We're going to move around. We're going to do things. We're going to be conscious. Some of us are going to have, if the Lord tarries, you and I are going to have conversations in heaven before the Lord comes back. Just like we're talking here, we'll be talking up there. There's stuff that goes on. We're going to do things. Not in, the, not in our dead body. That'll be in the ground. That'll be six foot under. Not in our resurrection body. That hasn't happened yet from that perspective. But in what? And this is where we don't have a lot of information. And, and there's sort of a friendly debate in Christian theology. Do, do we get an in-between body? Or, or is it just our spirit that has sort of a form to it? You know, like a cloud or a mist that moves along. And I can't answer that. But they debate one another. I figure if, if the Bible doesn't define it, I, I can't define it. But whether it's some kind of a temporary spiritual body or whether our spirit itself has a form, that's what we're going to be in. That's what we're going to be moving around in, okay? And really then, there are three stages we're going to go through. Now I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. There are three stages, and you'll see this. Two are really easy to see. The other one has to be deduced. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This passage is kind of helpful. Paul really is starting his teaching in chapter 4, uh, about things temporal and things eternal. If you look at chapter 4, verse 18, it says, you know, the things that we can see right now, they're all temporary. The things that we can't see, they're eternal. If you read verses before that, he's talking about we don't lose heart, even though our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed. So Paul is, is telling us, look at your outer man, it's growing old, but your inner man, hey, it's getting stronger, you're getting to be a better Christian, you're being sanctified, you're growing inwardly, so, so stuff is changing with you, there's good stuff that's happening to you. But then Paul makes a comparison between our current body and then our future resurrection body. In verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 5, he says, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, that's talking about death, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So now we have two bodies that are already described in verse 1. Stage 1, verse 1 calls our current body, and it calls it a tent, a tent. And remember, Paul was a tent maker, so he knew a lot about tents. And he calls this body that we have right now a tent because it's weak and it's temporary, and it can die like living in a tent. It's temporal. You pitch the tent, you live in it for a while, you put the tent back together again, you pull up the stakes and you move on, right? That's life now. That's stage number one. And then he skips stage number two and he says, the future body, stage three, is compared, also in verse one, to a building. This can't be any temporary body because it's eternal and it's not made with human hands. It's in the heavens. It's permanent building. It's solid. It's stable. That's referring to our resurrection bodies, the one we get in the very end, stage three. Our bodies, our resurrection bodies are strong. 
Our resurrection bodies that we're going to get are permanent. But that's all in the future. You say, well, what happened to stage two? Well, it's, it's deduced. It's in between. In between, we're still conscious. We still go on living. In other words, look down at verses six through eight. Look down at verses six through eight. There he says, therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And then there's a little parenthetical statement here. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Verse eight, we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. What's that? That's our spirit leaving the body, going and being at home with the Lord. After life in the tent and before life in the building, our spirit lives on. Our spirit works without a body. We are absent from the body here. We are present with the Lord. In fact, verse 8 says we are home with the Lord. You have those terms with and at home. Please understand that that's meant to communicate encouragement. That's meant to uh, communicate the closeness of fellowship we will have with God. We're not going to be another number in heaven. You know, did so-and-so die? Did anybody see so-and-so? There's personal relationship. If God knows the name of every single star in the universe, he knows you intimately. And you're going to be with him. You're going to be at home. You're going to have that sense that I finally arrived where I'm fully understood, where I was meant to be. This is home. This is it. It, it, it indicates a close face-to-face -face relationship with Jesus Christ, with God the Father. We're in fellowship with him. There is this in-between time, this intermediate state, this stage two. And we don't get told a whole lot about it. There's a little glimpse in the book of Revelation that we're going to take a peek at. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. This is actually during the tribulation time. And it's a glimpse of the souls in heaven during stage two. Now, stage two is my terminology. You're not going to find that in those verses, okay? <laughs> but these guys were killed because they were Christians and they were killed during the tribulation time. And it says in verse nine that they were slain because of the word of God. What does that mean? They stood up for their faith and they got killed. Verse 10, and they cried out. These are the souls now. They're not in a body. They're not raised. They're not res uh, in their resurrection bodies. It says, and they cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So they're up there in heaven. They're in their spirits. They're looking down on earth to some degree. They're waiting for justice to be given to them. And it goes on in verse 11. And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be complete. Now, there's going to be a lot more martyrs during the tribulation time, and you guys are going to have to be patient. This is only chapter 6 of the tribulation. We have to go through chapter 7 and 8 and 9 and 10. There's a lot more dying for the cause of Christ, and they're told, be patient. But what I want you to understand is these disembodied souls in stage 2, in the intermediate state, can talk. They can wear robes. One guy that was trying to argue that we don't really have bodies says, well, it doesn't say they wore the robes. It just says they were handed the robes. <laughs> I was thinking they were handed it because they're going to put it on. <laughs> they are praying because they're, they're interceding to God. They're actually praying in heaven. There's an interesting thought. Will we pray when we go to heaven? The answer is yes. They're aware of what's going on on earth to some degree. They have a sense of time. How long, O oh Lord? Some people say when we get to heaven, we'll have no sense of time. Evidently not. Evidently, there's some sense of time. They're also able to rest. All of that we glean just from a little, little glimpse there. And most importantly, they are right there with God. They're under the altar. Their souls protected by the wings of Almighty God. They're sheltered by the king of heaven. They're under God's protective care. Oh yeah, they got their head chopped off in life, but God says, you wait right here. You're special to me. How blessed is that, right? They are not being neglected in heaven. They are not being forgotten. It is worth it for them. Now I got to back up again. There's so many components to this that it's hard to 
put it all in order. But I want to back up a little bit here. In the Old Testament, when people died, they went to a place in Hebrew that was called Sheol. Sheol. When Sheol was translated in the Greek, such as in the Septuagint, it was translated Hades. Sheol does not refer just to the dirt in the ground, a grave. Grave is where the body goes, six feet under. Sheol is the place of the departed dead, where the departed spirits would gather. Sheol or Hades is not even hell. Hell is the lake of fire. And we know that Hades, all of the contents of Hades or Sheol, in the end times will be thrown into the lake of fire. We know that because it says that in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14. So that means that Hades is, and Sheol is a temporary place for the departed dead. And in the future, all of those temporary places will be finalized in the permanent hell, the lake of fire that burns on and on and on in torment. Hades or Sheol was the place where these disembodied spirits went upon dying. For example, in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 33, it says Jacob died. And it says Jacob was gathered to his people. Well, some people read that and say, yeah, he just was thrown in the family grave. I think it means more than that. I think it means that beyond the grave, as Jacob died, his spirit was reunited with his ancestors, with Isaac, with Abraham, with others. He got to be with those who were believers in the afterlife. The New Testament gives us greater progressive revelation and greater clarity. It lets us know that now after Jesus went to the cross and died and he was raised from the dead, we as believers go directly into the presence of God when we die. However, when Jesus was on earth before his crucifixion and resurrection, he taught about this intermediate state and the contents of Sheol or Hades. And he did it in what some people think is a parable, but it's called the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16. And I want us to turn to the gospel of Luke now and chapter 16, because this also gives us valuable information about the afterlife. Luke, gospel of Luke. Chapter 16, starting in verse 19. As you're turning, I'll say this is not a parable. First of all, Jesus never calls it a parable. But in none of Jesus' other parables does he ever give one of the characters in the story a name. And this is the only one where he gives him a name, Lazarus. And so this is probably not a parable. But I would say this, even if it is a parable... It is meant to be true to life. In other words, it would give us an accurate understanding of the afterlife, of the contents of Sheol and Hades and what happened. Look at verse 19. I'm going to read this whole section because it's fascinating. Verse 19, Luke uh, Luke 16, 19. Now, there was a rich man and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. He's living high off the hog, right? Verse 20. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Verse 22. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, see, he's a Jew, so thinks of Abraham as his great ancestor, right? Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. Let that be a warning to anyone. By the way, if you avoid Christ, look what is awaiting you. Verse 25, but Abraham said, child, Remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, father, that you send him to my father's house for I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, 
father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Scare them to death. Scare them into the kingdom is what he's saying. But the answer is, but he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Of course, that was true. When Jesus rose from the dead, many of them were not even persuaded. Wow, what a picture of the afterlife. One of the great glimpses and descriptions of the intermediate state. There are many observations we can make here about the intermediate state. Lazarus was with Abraham in paradise, where the righteous Jews went after death. The rich man is far away, suffering in Hades. And in this in-between stage, each of the three, Lazarus, Abraham, and the rich man, has some kind of a spiritual form some kind of a temporary body. Again, theologians argue, what is it? We don't know. Lazarus had a finger. (laughs) Dip your finger, right? Abraham had a chest, a bosom. The rich man had a tongue that he wanted cooled. The rich man was vocalizing and talking. He felt pain. He was in agony. He had unfulfilled lusts. Listen, they were having a definite conscious experience. You can't read that and not see that. We might even hear a little bit of boredom and monotony in the rich man's words and agony, certainly. But there's no relief for him. It's the same thing again and again and again. Won't there be any relief here? Does this sound like a cool beer party with your buddies in hell? By the way, those that are so tough these days, we all find out what happens after death. I'm sure I'll have a beer party with my buddies. Doesn't doesn't sound like that to me. Notice too, this is the unbeliever's destiny. It was fixed at death. Had someone tell me, well, I'll, I'll repent after I die if I find out it's true. Too late. Verse 26, a great chasm was fixed. There's no moving. Your, your eternity is fixed at the moment of death. The rich man also had a memory. He remembered, I would argue, a sharp memory. He was anxious for his brothers, five brothers. What's going to happen to them? Maybe he's the eldest brother and he's thinking about all these younger brothers, right? He he also had a sense of fairness and justice. He knew what he was getting was right. But he also, interestingly, as an unsaved person suffering... He had some compassion for his brothers. He wanted them to get saved. He wanted them to repent. He wanted them to get right with God before death. And he begged Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his brothers. But the response is, if they don't believe the Bible, the prophets, if they're not going to listen to Scripture, then they won't even change their mind if someone does something miraculous, comes back from the dead. Now, with the New Testament revelation, we know that Abraham's bosom is now in heaven. That's where paradise is. Remember Philippians 1, my desire is to depart and be with Christ. Not just Abraham, right? To be with Christ. So now we begin saying, okay, what happens from the moment that we die? I want to take us on a step-by-step preview of what happens from the moment we die. I have never died. So everything I'm saying to you, you may have to correct me on this later. When we get up there, you say, Pastor Leek, you messed that sermon up bad. It's not that way at all. So I'm I'm giving you the best I can with what I have. None of this originates with me. I found this in somebody's thoughts or some scripture. There's a journey we're going to go on. I'm going to describe it the best I can in step by step. Here's what you and I will experience as believers the moment we die. First, The soul or the spirit is going to slip out of the body. Maybe almost imperceptibly it will happen. Someone described it as a hand slipping out of a glove. You almost haven't even realized it's happened. You are no longer in your body and now you're aware you're not in your body. Maybe you're hovering over your body. You perceive consciously that the pain that you had in your body if you've been sick for a long time is over. You don't sense and feel the pain of the body anymore. It feels strange, something's happening to you, but it doesn't feel bad. 
Paul, when he tried to describe what happened to him when he was caught up to the third heaven in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2, he said, I know a man, he was referring to himself, I know a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. He said, my experience was so weird. I can't tell you whether I went up to the third heaven in my body or whether I was out of my body. It was that crazy. So I think it's going to be something like that. We're like, I'm out of my body. Am I out of my body? Wait a minute. I have a body. What is this? It's going to be something like that. It will feel like we have some form, but it won't be the same body. It's possible you'll see people in that very room before you depart. You'll see them carrying over your body. See some ambulance worker over you or whatever. I guess that's possible. Or see the area outside, right, as you're slipping out of your body because you're going to have visual ability. And then second, immediately, you are going to encounter bright, shiny angels. Jesus said, and here we deal with something that is explicit that when Lazarus died, immediately there were angels that were sent to do what? To escort him to paradise. He didn't know where paradise is. You know, I got a ticket to paradise, but you don't know where it is, right? A one-way ticket to paradise, but you got to know where it is. You don't know where it is. Do the angels know where it is? So the angels are there immediately at death to make sure you are taken where you are supposed to go. Now, this makes sense. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14, it says that angels serve the elect. It says that they're there to aid us in all of our circumstances of life. Well, what's a more critical juncture than when we face death, right? It makes sense that angels are immediately present and they intercept the spirit. God said he would never leave us or forsake us, right? And they constantly watch over us on earth. It makes sense. They know the moment we're dying and they are there right at that moment. And when we say angels, please understand why sometimes I go off on these silly little fat Christmas cherubs that we all say are the angels. I don't think they're going to look like that at all. That's not going to comfort me. That's all I get for an escort. I mean, that's, I waited for you. It's not going to be Clarence trying to earn his wings or anything like that. This has got to be someone that I can have some confidence in, right? Angels in the Bible always appear as young, strong warriors. That's what I'm talking about. Celestial Marines, powerful, glorified, and shiny angels, escort, more than one of them. I told my mom about this, and she was very excited. She couldn't wait to see them. And furthermore, they're well-trained. How many people die every single day as believers? They've been doing this for hundreds of years. They know the routine. Someone's not forgetting one of their duties. They know exactly what to do. Precision, accuracy, no mistakes. You ever seen these military men do things with the flag and how they fold everything precisely? Think how much greater these angels are going to be. They've got it down to precision. Then third, we go on a trip. We go on what appears to be a very speedy trip from earth to what we call heaven. And we use the word heaven and we don't really even know what we're describing when we say that. More accurately, some might say, we're going to go from this dimension into another dimension. Why is it that people have a hard time believing in another dimension? You have all of these physics people these days and all of these sci-fi things arguing from quasi-science that there's some other sphere out there and they have a hard time when the Bible already beat them to the punch and said, yeah, we, we know about that other sphere. We know about that other domain. It's called heaven. Well, it's there and we're gonna go there. Travel time from your body on earth to heaven from every indication is not long at all. There's no three-hour delay. There's no traffic jam. The trip is going to be amazing. It's going to be filled with awe. Your imagination and my imagination could not dream it up. What we will be seeing, hearing, feeling, maybe smelling will be beyond anything that we could experience with the limitations of this body. We will pass through the first heaven. What's that? The sky. We will soar through the second heaven. What's that? Outer space. Making, by the way, Star Trek seem like old technology, right? The journey will be fast, but it won't be hectic. It will be serene. It will be calm. And then we will enter into the third heaven, another dimension, a place physics can only speculate about now. And fourth, with stunning change, we will be in a totally new environment. 
Again, how do we describe it? It's bright. It's orderly. It's clean. It's gorgeous. But it's warm. It's inviting. It's friendly. It's kind. It's exciting. It's filled with activities. There are all kinds of creatures that are there. Our surroundings will be so new, so different, we're going to struggle even to find words to describe it. It will be more different than we can imagine, but not scary, not disturbing, not unsettling. Wonderful is the word I would use. Amazing, jaw-dropping. Dr. Adrian Rogers, the great Baptist preacher, in his sermon, Five Minutes After Death, said this, the most amazing time you will ever spend will be the first five minutes after you die because it's all going to be new. It's going to be amazing. And then fifth, we are going to begin encountering beings in heaven. And we ask, who is it that we will see first as we enter into this heavenly glory? And the answer is, I'm not sure. It's not detailed in scripture. I think the first one we're going to see is Jesus. I think that is the case because after all, we are his sheep and he calls us by name, John chapter 10, verse four. We are his people and we're purchased by him, Titus chapter two, verse 14. I think Jesus will look us in the eye. I think Jesus will call us by name and I think we will see in him great compassion everlasting, faithful love, understanding of everything that we've been through. But I think we are going to be shocked by the power and the energy and the glory that flows from him. His gentleness, I think maybe we expect it. The absolute majestic power of Jesus Christ will just shock us. The song says, I can only imagine how I will respond. Will I dance? Will I fall down? I'll give my opinion. I think we'll fall down. I think we'll be like John. There was no closer person to Jesus on earth than John the Apostle. He was, he was his closest disciple. John the Apostle knew Jesus and the heart of Jesus' teaching had insights better than any man. And I, I think that's fair to say that. And when John in his old age saw Jesus in his glorified state, on the island of Patmos in Revelation chapter 1, John says, I fell at his feet like a dead man. Of course, he was frail and af afraid. I think we are going to have a mixture. And people debate, when we are we supposed to be afraid of God or are we supposed to love God? And theologies can stress one or the other. But we are told to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? We're also told that the beginning of wisdom is to fear God, right? Strange as it may be, I think at that moment we are going to have a feeling of, of, of the most awesome awe and reverence we've ever had in our life and the most loving attraction to the person of Jesus at the same time. And I don't even, I don't even know how to fit those two thoughts together. I think we're going to fear God and love God immensely. We're going to see the nail print in his hands. We're going to see the scar on his side. And we're going to remember as we fall on our faces in worship, he loves me. This is the one that is the reason why I'm safe and secure. This is the one that went to his father's house to prepare it for me. And we will know right then and there we are home that this world was not my home. We will know as if we've been gone on a very long trip, finally, finally I am home with loved ones. Now there's a lot more that's gonna happen and I wanna talk about that in part three, but I wanted to get to Jesus in this one because I think, I think he's the first one we're gonna see. And if it doesn't work exactly like that, we are gonna see Christ and we know that because the scripture says that, amen? amen? And now let's fellowship with Christ around the table. Let me just say a prayer here for our Lord's Supper. Father, thank you for your word. Bless the preaching of it. Help us to apply it in our souls with our faith and bless us as we come around your table right now, Lord Jesus, unto your glory we pray it. Amen.